got a pretty full agenda uh, this morning. So uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for taking the time to to join us. Um, uh, as a way of reminder introduction, I'm Nikki Lemon with Franklin County Public Health, and uh, I chair the Health Department Advisory Panel along with Mike Cooper uh, that you can see there. Hi, Mike. Um, Good morning, Nikki. Good morning. Uh, just a few uh, housekeeping uh, reminders. Uh, please mute your phones throughout the call uh, to eliminate any background noise. And uh, those calling in, uh, you should be able to press star six uh, to unmute uh, if you need to speak during the call. You can auto also utilize the chat feature or the raised hand feature uh, if you have any uh, questions. If you're unable to send any questions through the chat, uh, you can always email uh, Jeff Montavon, and his email is Jeffrey, J E F F R E Y dot M O N T A V O N at epa.ohio.gov. And as a reminder, this meeting is being recorded and it will be available to watch at a later date. Uh, so with that all out of the way, uh, Jeff, would you mind uh, doing roll call, please? Yes, sure. So start off Mike Cooper. Yeah, right here, Jeff. Good morning. Hey, good morning, Mike. Jeff Ritchie. I'm here. Thank you. Craig Ward. Here. That's Craig. Barry Grise. Yep, here, Jeff. Paul de Pascal. Or Paul de Pascal, sorry. Paul available. I'm not hearing Paul. Rick Garrison. And not hearing Rick. Chuck de Yonker. I'm here. Good morning. Chuck. Larry Schaefer. I'm not hearing Larry. Paul Montgomery. Present. Hi, Paul. Joe Mazzola. I'm not hearing Joe. Garrett Giozzi. Morning, Jeff. I'm here. Hey, Garrett. Richard Novickis. So I'm not hearing Richard and Beth Bickford. Okay, and Beth, I believe, is not able to make it either. So it looks like we do have a quorum. So thank you, Nikki. Okay, great. Thank you, Jeff. Um, a little bit of background. Uh, the Health Department Advisory Panel was established to create a stronger relationship between the Ohio EPA Division of Material and Waste Management and also approved uh, local health departments. HDAP provides input to the Ohio EPA DIMWIM, so the agency may assist local health departments in various aspects related to solid and infectious waste and construction and demolition debris programs. Members of this panel uh, do participate voluntarily with two representatives participating from each of Ohio EPA's uh, district regions. And with that, I will turn it over for updates. Uh, we do have some updates from Ohio EPA and first on the agenda is Vlad Sika, Ohio EPA chief. Oh. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Great. Thanks for joining us. Sure. Um, well, I'm not sure what uh, everyone wanted me to say this morning as far as updates, but I think uh, the big update that some of you may know and some of you may not is that um, I am retiring um, effective tomorrow. But um, I did kind of want to have briefly chat with you folks today. Um, um, just kind of uh, lay that out there and also say that uh, it's been a real pleasure um, an honor working with a lot of you folks on a lot of different issues 
um, over the past several years. Um, I'm leaving a really solid team behind, and I think um, they're going to continue to to work with you and, and do really, really good work together. But um, it, it has been a pleasure. Uh, I'm going to be sad to leave, but, uh, you know, everyone has their time, and it's my time now. But uh, it was um, it was a lot of fun, and uh, I think that's pretty much it for me. Wow. Well, congratulations. Um, happy retirement. Thank you. Um, that's that's exciting. Very exciting. And and the thank you for all of your leadership and support throughout the years. It's um, it's been amazing. Um, I I'll open it up if anyone uh, wants to. Uh, share any uh, congratulations. Um, there are several in the chat there for you. Yeah, I saw that. Thank you, everyone. Congrats, Vlad. Uh, Nikki, I would make a motion to not accept his retirement. <laughs> uh, he can't leave us all behind. I am for that. <laughs> yeah, Chet's I'll been second that. that as well, so denied. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I hope you enjoy it. Um, oh, and, I will. Yeah. Gosh. But, um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank, thanks to everyone. Keep doing the work that you're doing. Thank you. All right, with that, we will um, turn it over to Michelle Mountjoy with a rules update. Thank you again, Vlad. Hi, everyone. Um, so Aaron is going to be on later and he is going to do the bulk of our rules update for DIMWIM because what we've been working on mostly are the CNDD processing facility rules. So I won't touch those and steal his thunder, but other rule packages we've been working on are we have the fee rules that went out to interest the party quite a bit ago. We're still working to get those filed with JCAR. We haven't forgotten about them, but um, and we haven't finished our response to comments yet either, but that's still in progress. We also had an ESO for beneficial use go out about a month ago, and the comments were due a few weeks ago, and we got a few comments on those rules. We also had one go out for solid waste transfer facilities, and we had one set of comments from Chuck, and we got one set of comments on those, but we did get comments. Thank you, Chuck on the solid waste transfer facility rules. Other than that, we have probably the solid waste incinerator rules are gonna go out for interested party comment in the next week or two. Um, many of you don't have incinerators because we don't have any in the state except for one, um, And but we still have those rules in the books and we need to review them. So if you are interested, look forward to those coming out as well. Other than that, I'm happy to answer questions, but that's basically my update for this meeting. All right, thank you, Michelle. Um, does anyone have any questions for Michelle? All right, All if right, not, bye. we'll move on to Chet Cheney. Thank you, Michelle. Morning, Chet. You're muted, Chet. Thank you. I need a lot of help this morning. Um, so I, I just want to say something in regards to to our chief. I mean, he has been a. A wonderful asset to this division um, and an extremely calming force uh, with the employees Stop here. Stop it, Chet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we have tried numerous times and ways to convince him not to retire, but it just doesn't seem to be working. Um, he actually was the one that had approved and agreed to to develop the Health Department Advisory Panel uh, because it's always been his vision to have a stronger relationship with the Health Department. So I just uh, I can't compliment him enough in his vision and in his work with uh, this division and with the Health Department. So, but moving on, uh, we had uh, staff had started working on a newsletter regarding uh, best management practices for solid waste districts, uh, the 52 solid waste districts in the state of Ohio. There has been some interest and we would like to hear feedback from the panel, whether or not that this is a direction you would like to go. 
that there be some type of communication, uh, whether it's a newsletter or electronic newsletter or whatever, uh, between uh, the agency division specifically uh, in the health departments and in best management practices, programs and services that people are implementing and how they're implementing them to share that information with their counterparts in other parts of the state. We realize that Ohio is a very large state. Um, not every health department is the same as the next one, uh, but if there are opportunities to share information, generally is a good idea. And so uh, we wanted to kind of put that out there as an opportunity for the health department to work in conjunction with the, the division to put together perhaps a quarterly electronic newsletter uh, in that regard. So uh, it's just a general concept, uh, but we thought we'd bring it to the Health Department Advisory Panel to see what uh, their thoughts may be. I do re remember uh, when we first started this group, uh, there were two tracks that we wanted to work on. One was training, which is going to be again addressed today. Uh, and we have Jeff and Folks uh, have done a fabulous job of pushing out training opportunities for health departments over the last couple of years, uh, but we have not addressed the communication side of things, and that's where we're attempting to to uh, try to check that box if we can. So, Nikki, I don't know if you want to have a conversation now or maybe later about that. We want to kind of put that out on the table. Yeah, I think. Um... It, it sounds great. Um, I would open it up uh, if anyone has any immediate um, thoughts or feedback on that, and then perhaps um, if folks want a little bit more time to kind of think about that and maybe uh, towards the end of the, the meeting when we're discussing the bylaws, we can um, also discuss that. Um, but it, it my first thought is that it would be uh, it would be great. I think a great resource. Super. And obviously people can email us and or put something in the chat now or later about their thoughts and what that would kind of look like. We'd be happy to work with a smaller subset of the, the panel, perhaps uh, on an ongoing basis to come up with suggestions and ideas uh, as to what topic should be addressed uh, as we go forward. And I know this kind of came from Joe, and if Joe wants to kind of chime in, this is actually a good segue into that. Yeah, uh, I, I would just add some thoughts. Yeah, no, thanks, Chad. I, I would just add that just like everything else that we're doing, um, you know, we, we, we certainly want to facilitate that, but it would be seen as a partnership. And so one of the things, uh, as Chet mentions, we we're, we're drafting this currently for our solid waste districts. And again, whether it's a separate newsletter or a uh, shared one um we have local local spotlights for example right so we would expect that you know certainly we can provide programmatic updates uh here from the division but at the same time we really want to focus on kind of that information sharing across health departments um and so it could be um case studies it could just be a new program or, or something that might be happening within local health departments to be part of this uh, so just something to add on to what Chet was was covering. Thanks, Joe. Um, and I guess I will I will officially introduce you since you are next on the the agenda. Joe Goakachea is the assistant chief, and um, I think you are going to uh, also talk about on demand training. Yeah, yeah, I can I can yeah. dive into that too. Uh, but before I do, not to layer it on too thick, since uh, I was kind of thinking as as Vlad was kind of chiming in, I'm not sure if he walked away. But hopefully he did. But um, but we're gonna miss him. And uh, if everyone that knows Vlad, he's a pretty simple uh, and humble man. Um, but uh, he certainly has had a you know he's been with our division when he started or years ago, but more recently, and uh, he certainly had I think a positive and probably a more significant impact. Uh, then he he realizes that's going to allow all of us to be successful in the years to come. And and when I say all of us, I include the health departments uh, because, again, you know, this is truly a partnership and uh, we appreciate um, 
you know, this forum as well as the other interactions that we have on a more regular basis. Um, in terms of the uh, the training update, as as Chet mentioned, again, the two tracks that have been kind of the pillars of this forum have been both communication and training. And so, as I think everyone on this call is familiar, uh, Jeff and, and Leanne and team have, have uh, coordinated, and in some cases, I think Mahoning County and other health departments have been part of these uh, training events for most recently um, some groundwater training. Uh, we did leachate management training, and so uh, these have been, I think, well received, a great opportunity for us to partner uh, to provide training events. And so what we've been talking about internally in recent months is how do we best deliver that? And I think after those trainings, uh, they have certainly been uh, put up onto our YouTube channel and other ways to get those out. Um, but we've had some discussions and what we want to bring to the group today is an opportunity to, uh, through our own system that we use for our staff, uh, we have an opportunity to bring in uh, folks outside of our agency. And so we want to see if there's a way to, well, there is a way we want to see how best to deliver this training, which is it's on our called Ohio Learn platform. Um, and we'll have we'll be developing uh, like a one pager on how uh, health department staff can establish accounts uh, for those that have taken the Inspector Training Academy. As I understand it, those folks already have accounts, but we can we can we can broaden that to include any uh, health department inspector who performs uh, the solid waste, infectious waste, and C and D programs. Um, and so, what we want to do first is have a release of uh, four trainings uh, that would include landfills, what we're calling landfills 101, landfills 102 in terms of the construction, design, and operations of landfills. Uh, we also have an infectious waste 101 uh, training, and we also have a general uh, introduction to um, inspection letters and correspondence and enforcement. Um, and so all these trainings are available. Um, this is completely optional uh, for, for health departments and for your staff, but we believe it's a great opportunity uh, to have these on-demand uh, training modules available. Um, and, and so we want to find out the best way through this group on how to reach, uh, in some cases it's you know those that are on this call, but in some cases it might be your staff uh, that would most benefit uh, from this training opportunity. Um, so that, that's what we wanted to bring to the group today. Uh, we certainly also want to continue to hear uh, what other topics uh, you and your staff may be interested in. Uh, you know, we've, we've heard, as I mentioned earlier, most recently groundwater monitoring at landfills, as well as leachate management systems. Um, but there's a whole host of other trainings, um, whether it's landfill related, other facility types that that the division uh, covers um, or, or certain aspects of that. So uh, we certainly want to get your feedback on, on how to best uh, develop new training, but also how to deliver that uh, because we can't always reach, you know, everybody on some of those live events, right? So to have them on demand allows folks who missed it, but also as we see a continuous uh, uh, change of staff, new hires coming in, um, it allows us to get that to those folks as well. So. I think that's what I wanted to cover today. And uh, if I miss anything, Jeff or, or Chet, uh, please please weigh in. But I'll leave it at that and uh, open it up to any questions um, or get any feedback that you may have. All right. Thank you, Joe. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments for Joe? That's that's fine. And, and so again, uh, just like Chet said, uh, feel free to uh, I think everyone through this appointment has Jeff Montavon's email. And so please reply directly to him or um, or to me. And ultimately, um, if you have other ideas, we certainly want to have those to, to get this to the right folks. But what we are working on, uh, unless anybody has any objection to it, um, it is a instruction sheet on how to uh, establish an account in the Ohio EPA platform uh, for this training. Uh, we will probably work with our district staff who work closely with the health department inspectors to 
uh, make sure that they're aware of this opportunity. Um, and we can also work through this, uh, this forum, through this panel uh, to, to provide that as well. So there are other avenues to reach the intended audience, which are those inspectors that implement the solid waste, uh, infectious waste and CND programs. Uh, please let us know, but outside of that, we'll we'll take the path of those of those two channels. Sounds good. I'm Thank looking you. forward to it. Um, next on the agenda is Leanne Greenlee with um, an update on the Mosquito Control Grant. Leanne, good morning. Hello. All right, so I don't have a huge update on the grant. Um, and we did actually send out emails uh, kind of like announcing the awardees for 2022. We are awarding 48 grants totaling over $800,000. Uh, it covers a good portion of the state. We are in the contract stage, so we have sent out contracts through um, an e-signature program called OneSpan. Uh, those are all distributed. We're waiting on people to sign them. So if you haven't seen it and you're expecting it, let me know. I can always resend it. We have quite a few that are fully in effect. We are also working on doing an awards ceremony here in Columbus. We just secured the day of May 17th. So an invitation to all of our grantees will be going out next week. We're excited that we can do it in person again. We'll have our giant check. We'll have our uh, mosquito mascot. So we're looking forward to that and preparing for that part of it. Um, you know, if you have questions about the 2022 grant cycle or anything looking forward, you can always reach out to me and Jeff. We're happy to talk with people. And that's kind of my update. I'll let Jeff continue on. I know he has some more updates that are more relevant to the previous year's grant. It's, thanks, Lee. And just kind of um, adding to that, we did send out um, a mandatory training announcement yesterday. I know we've been receiving some questions about finding that on Ohio Learn, so I'm looking in to get some answers for that right now. So hopefully we, those who are having difficulty finding the training, we can get that sorted out for you this afternoon and have some more details on that. So we are looking at it. So I know several people have mentioned that this morning and then yesterday afternoon. So we are on top of it and hopefully we'll have the best path to get there this afternoon for you. Um, and just kind of the 2021 mosquito control grants, um, just a reminder for those of you who do have 2021 grants, the deadline to spend funds is April 30th, 2022. So that's this Saturday. So it's just coming up pretty quick. If you have any funds remaining, purchases could be made before the deadline and then delivered after April 30th. Uh, but the invoices or any receipts should show the purchases made before the deadline. So if you order something today, if you have 200 bucks left and you decide you want more mosquito dunks or something like that just to have on hand, you can do that, but the invoice should be dated for today or tomorrow, or I guess even Saturday. I don't imagine you'll be ordering anything on Saturday, but it could be for that. So uh, just a reminder for that, but then the uh, final report will not be done due until July 1st, so um, you can complete those online using the final report tool. This is the first year we're requiring you use the online tool, so uh, we anticipate probably some people will have some issues with it, so if you have any problems accessing the tool, feel free to give me a call or send me an email, and I'm happy to assist and um, run through any issues. We can also set up a meeting. Um, you can share your screen. We can take a look at what you're seeing, because I know that's helpful for some people, but I know this is a, a new tool for everyone, and we want to make sure you can successfully use it, and it's not more of a hassle than just in a paper form. Um, and that's pretty much the updates we have on the 2021 Mosquito Control Grant. So if you have any questions, say feel free to pop them in there now, or you can send me an email or give me a call uh, today or tomorrow. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Leanne. Uh, let's see. So next on the agenda is an, uh, up, an update from the Ohio Environmental Health Association and Garrett Giozzi will be presenting. Garrett, are you still there? Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am still here. Just a quick update from OEHA. Uh, we had our in-person conference April 14th through 15th. Uh, it was a great turnout. It was really good to finally get to see all of our colleagues again after uh, two years of being remote. 
Um, the next conference, the next annual education conference is going to be April 13th and 14th, uh, 2023 at the Marriott Columbus Northwest up there in Dublin. Um, and additionally, I would just add that we are continuing to expand continuing education offer, uh, opportunities to our members, and those can be found on our website in the member portal. So uh, we will be adding several more presentations over the coming uh, weeks to the uh, member portal. And I think, Nikki, that's it. I know our district conference dates should be announced soon uh, for the fall conferences. Uh, we are working to provide four fall conferences uh, throughout the state, so those should be announced uh, very soon. That's what I have. Great, thank you, Garrett. Uh, let's see, uh, next um, is an update from the Association of Ohio Health Commissioners, AOHC, and Jeff will be presenting on behalf of Beth Bickford. Yeah, so thanks, Nikki. So Beth wasn't able to make it today, so she had a couple of points she wanted me to bring up uh, during a meeting here today. So um, first of all, she mentioned that um, AOHC will be starting in-person classes in June 2022. So they do have a listing of those opportunities on their website. I'm going to put that in the chat so uh, you can go ahead and visit there and see what kind of opportunities they have coming up here. Um, AOHC is also currently developing a salary survey and hope to have this available for everyone at the fall conference, which kind of leads us to that topic. September 14th through 16th, the 2022 Association of Ohio Health Commissioners Fall Conference will be held in person at the Embassy Suites in Dublin, Ohio. So um, they do have a save the date available, but uh, the agenda is not yet ready. So just keep an eye on their website for more details on that. So I will put the website in the chat right now. Um, so you can access that and kind of see what's on the education calendar. And that's all the updates we had from AOHC. Thank you, Jeff. Um, now we'll move to Catherine Allen with Ohio EPA Public Interest Center to give an update on the website redesign and overview. Catherine? You're muted, Catherine. About that. Try again. OK, I had to put my dog away and I think I muted myself. Um, so I am with the Public Interest Center, which is the public relations area of Ohio EPA. I may have met some of you through the Inspector Training Academy. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is our new website design. We've had it up for about four months now, so you might be pretty familiar with it, but I did want to go over some of the major points of it and answer any questions if you had any. So Jeff, if you could kind of watch the chat and let me know if there's questions that come up since I'm going to be sharing my screen. Yep, will do. All right, and let me go ahead and share. All right, can everybody see my internet? Yes, we can see it. All right, great. So as you know, this is the new home page. It's a little bit different than the old website. We do still have this main banner here, but it's not a scrolling banner. What we've done instead is we have um, featured content links here to kind of get you to the most um, frequently requested content or content that maybe is a focus of the agency. One of the reasons why we went to this new standard format for those that are curious is all the state agencies wanted to have a commonality where regardless of what state agency's website you were at, you would recognize it as a state agency site. So a lot of the state agencies have gone to this Innovate Ohio platform. So you may see that the a lot of the sites do look similar to this and have the same layout with these cards. We call these cards and then um, the general clean look and um, design of the features and things like that. So if you are on other sites, you will notice they do look similar. One of the main things for you to remember is our main address is still epa.ohio.gov. So you should be able to keep that as a main bookmark. Any other bookmarks are going to have changed. So make sure that you go in and you find the information that you need for new bookmarks. If you want to get to Dimwim's home page quickly, you can just type in epa.ohio.gov slash DMWM. And that will take you right to their website. So again, you can bookmark that. 
the site is responsive and mobile friendly. So if you're on your screen and someone's trying to um, walk you through what they're looking at on their phone, you can actually minimize your screen by clicking there for your browser. You can pull it over and this is what somebody would see if they're on their phone. So that's kind of a nice feature. You can sometimes use that to help people who are on their phone, help them navigate a little bit better. Um, again, you will need to update all your bookmarks. We are working on updating links that are within PDFs and other documents, but you may very well find documents that have broken links. If you do find those, just let your DIMWIM um, representative know or if need be, you can contact me as well and we can try to get that corrected. The top navigation bar stays the same throughout the whole site. And what we did was we tried to come up with about five different areas that are common areas that people might be looking for information. So we've got stay compliant, make a difference, monitor pollution, get funding and find regulations. Go ahead and take some time to look through all those, familiarize yourself with that. The other thing that's common throughout all of the pages is these bottom areas, the bottom footers. This gets you to the customer support center. And then the, again, four common areas here that we knew that people might be looking for information. So this is something that you can always rely on on whatever page you're on to get to these areas of common interest. Um, the district page, you can get through this link right here, and then divisions and offices is also a quick way to get to it from there. Another thing that you may notice is this breadcrumb. This breadcrumb will actually change based on what page you're on, and it's a good way, especially if you enter the site from outside, so from a Google search or from a document, this will give you a good idea of where you landed, and maybe if you want to go back a little bit to figure out kind of what neighborhood you're in if you got directly to the door. So this is a good way to kind of go back and forth. If you're having trouble finding information um, and you need to call somebody and tell them where you are on the website, it will be a lot easier for you to reference this breadcrumb rather than reading out the website address. So that's another tip for you. All right, so the next thing that we want to talk about, very important for you guys to always know how to find is rules and regulations. So we do have, again, this link for find regulations at the top menu. So you can click on that from any page. You can go to um, different areas based on the stage of the rule process. If you want to go directly to DMWM, just click on that DIMWIM regulations. And then again, you see that reflected here too, the different stages in the process. So once you're on the topic page that you're interested in, so let's go to the effective rules page. You're going to see uh, different information based on what you're looking at for the stage. The card will take you to the specific page. So in other words, from the welcome page, you can get to the early stakeholder outreach from here or from here. On the effective rules page, we've changed it a little bit to make sure that all of the division's effective rules pages are the same. So what you'll see at the top of the page is you will see complete chapter references. So some people don't wanna see just a single um, reference, they wanna see the whole chapter. So what we've done is we've created PDFs of the entire chapters there. If you do wanna search for a single rule reference, you can go through this table here. Again, the full chapters are listed first. You can sort this table by the rule number, by the title, by the chapter, or by the effective date. You can change the number of entries that are shown. And again, you can search for a keyword. Individual rules, um, again, will open the full PDF. And then down here, once you click on a PDF, you're going to get that single chapter. All right, I'm going through my notes here, make sure I cover everything. Okay, so the next thing we want to talk about is searching the website. So I will admit 
that our website has never been very good with the search. This one is a lot better. The best way to search the entire site is you're going to use this search button right here. And you do want to make sure that if you're searching for an entire term, you want to put it in quotation marks. So let's search for construction and demolition debris. And you will see that if that's a term that you've searched for before, it will pop up for you. So I'm going to go ahead and search. And you'll see it found 64 resources. So that's pretty good. Um, when you get to the search page, one thing that I recommend for people is to go ahead and look at this path right here. And that will, in addition to the description, that will help you know that you're getting to the place where you're looking for. You can also use um, an apostrophe or an asterisk at the beginning of any search term to increase the search terms. All right, so let's go back to the home page for DIMWIM. And again, I'm going to go down here, and this time I'm going to click on the divisions and offices. And I'm going to go ahead and click on the DIMWIM card. And my internet is slow today, so I apologize for that. Um, what we've done is we've tried to, for all of the different divisions, put common items here in the left navigation. So again, regardless of what division you're in, you're going to be seeing similar um, areas where you can find information. So let's go ahead and go to the guides and manuals section. And you will see that there is a search area here as well. These search areas that you will see on these pages are only going to be searching the information in this area. So in other words, the cards or the pages that are associated with this. So what you want to do is you want to make sure if you're not sure what area it's in that you're using this big search here that will search the entire site. If you do know for sure that you want to look at guides and manuals, we are working on tagging all the pages with topics. So some pages you'll see will have these topics listed. I'll go to in a minute to surface water and show you how that works. Um, but right now we start out with two pages of cards, which isn't bad. But let's say I want to look at um, incineration. So if I put in the word, it is going to narrow those results to three. So what it's searching for is it's searching for any word that you've typed in in the title or in the description. So again, it's not searching the content of the, the entire page like this would. It's just searching those titles and um, descriptions. But that is a way that you can narrow down the number of cards on a page. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the Division of Surface Water and show you an example of those topics. And again, I'm going to use my breadcrumb this time. I'm going to go to their guides and manuals. And on theirs, they also have about two pages. And here, if you click on topics, we actually have some of these pages tagged with different topics. So I'm just going to do um, NPDES. And you can see it limited it down to four different cards. So again, that's the important thing to remember with these two different search options. This one is searching just cards or pages in that area. This one will search the whole site. All right, so how can I get help? If you um, are not able to find what you're looking for, the best thing to do is click either here on this help icon, or you can also click here on help center on the footer. Either of those will get you to the same place. This is our main help center area. The contact list on the left provides you with telephone numbers. All of our 800 or important phone numbers that you might need quickly are listed at the top. Phone numbers are listed for each division. And if you are viewing this on your cell phone, you can actually click on that and that will call the number. If you click within these links, it will open up the contact information for that division. So again, for DIMWIM. 
And this is where you can find specific contact information for staff members who handle different areas. Another thing that we see on this help page is contact us, which has different ways for you to contact us based on the information that you need. So again, for general questions and website is issues, we do have a general contact form. Uh, you can use the customer support center for technical questions and assistance. We have a link to the complaint tracker. And then for any of your customers who maybe want to give us a survey in terms of how their experience was, we do have a survey listed here as well. Um, let's see. Jeff, do you want me to talk about the customer support center at all, or do you just want to keep it to the website? Um, I think we've got a minute. If you want to go ahead and cover that, that'd be great. Okay. All right, so again, if you need help, go ahead and use those links on the Help Center. You can always contact me. Uh, I can leave my name and address, email address in the chat. The Customer Support Center is an area that has um, a lot of your applications, so maybe you've seen it if you used it for the Mosquito application. I'm pretty sure it's through there, but it has frequently asked questions. It does have the ability for you to chat with folks from our Office of Compliance Assistance and Pollution Prevention. And then it also has publications listed and um, an ask a question form that you can actually use to ask more specific questions. So with this ask a question form, you can select a category that you're interested in. So in other words, scrap tires, you can go ahead and submit that question. And through the system, it will route that question to a staff member pretty immediately that is prepared to answer your question on those scrap tires. So that's all I have for my presentation. Like I said, I will go ahead and put my information in the chat and I will answer any questions you have at this point. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was um, fantastic. Uh, I think that those um, updates or upgrades and changes to uh, the website are going to be really helpful. Sure thing, and I will put a copy of the presentation that I used just to read my notes. So you've all got that anyway. I know I went kind of quickly. I wanted to make sure you had enough time for the rest of your items. But if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to me and I'd be glad to help you. Thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. So if anyone does have any questions, um, please put those in the chat or feel free to raise your hand or just unmute yourself and, and ask. Uh, otherwise, um, we'll move on to Aaron Shear with a rules update for CNDD. But thank you again, Catherine. Absolutely. So I've got uh, Aaron's presentation here, so he's pre-recorded that. So bear with me. I'm going to make sure I can share the audio with you here. Just give me a thumbs up if you can hear it. Good morning. Uh, I know many of you on today's call. For those that I don't know, um, I'm Aaron Shear. I'm the supervisor with the Construction and Demolition Debris Unit here in the Division of Materials and Waste Management at Ohio EPA. Uh, I was asked to give a quick overview of the uh, new construction and demolition debris processing facility program. We had some rules that went into effect last week and another rule package that's currently at JCAR for rule review, hopefully to be uh, promulgated later this uh, spring, early summer. So construction demolition debris processing um, for many years, actually since the uh, early 90s, we regulated construction and demolition debris landfills and disposal in the state, but we didn't have um, as much rulemaking authority and authority when it came to the intermediate steps of construction and demolition debris processing, uh, handling, transfer, just the general management of, of CNDD. Um, back in 2017, uh, Senate Bill 2, the director finally did get authority to promulgate additional rules regarding the processing of construction demolition debris. 
And that was just to ensure that the material was uh, managed and dealt with in a responsible manner. Uh, we want to promote landfill diversion. We want to promote that these waste streams are recycled, reused, and reused in a beneficial way. But we also wanted to make sure we had rules that were safe and protective of human health and the environment. With that said, we started on rule writing efforts, uh, 2018 and 2019. Uh, with some stakeholder feedback, we realized that um, a lot of the processing rules we were looking at for landfill facilities may be duplicative. And so it made sense. sense uh, once we got input from stakeholders that maybe we should bifurcate these rules into two packages, uh, one that deals with standalone processing facilities and more uh, another one that dealt with co-located processing facilities, those that are on the landfill footprint. So what do I mean by that? Well, the standalone facilities are those kind of third party construction demolition debris processors. They're kind of the transfer facilities. Uh, they may be doing some limited recycling or recycling of CNDD. Um, they're still processing the material, but they're not doing it at a landfill. And so I'll be talking about that rule package here shortly. Um, the second set of uh, facilities would be those that are located within the landfill footprint. So those are usually associated with landfilling activities. Prior to landfilling, they're doing processing, they're doing recycling of the material um, prior to that ultimate disposal. So for the standalone rules, uh, those went effect last Monday, April 18th. We created a whole new rule series for that package. Um, hopefully most people are familiar with chapter 3745-400. That's our general um, CNDD regs. Our landfill regulations are, are in there as well. But we created 50 through 60 to mainly deal with processing facilities. These standalone facilities will have a permit to install there'll be various design requirements that are needed to be in that permit. Uh, there's different uh, manners in which the permit needs to be issued, revoked, suspended, denied, uh, transferred. Um, there's financial assurance with these facilities and there's uh, methods on how to acquire financial assurance. Uh, and then there's a way to finally close the, the site um, after it's been operating. As far as the co-located CDD rules, uh, those rules uh, will have a similar framework, but they will be kind of folded into existing landfill rules. Um, and so we're looking at the existing regulatory framework, also found in 400, but 07, 11, 12, 13, and 26 of that chapter already exist for landfills. So here we're just incorporating concepts of CNDD processing um, within that landfill footprint. Those rules, as I said, were just filed last week with JCAR. There is a public hearing uh, or a JCAR hearing coming up in May, and we're looking at hopefully filing that rule package end of May or in June. Um, in both scenarios, we're looking at having both types of facilities, the co-located processing facilities and the standalone processing facilities uh, licensed in the 2023 uh, calendar year. So they'll have that 180 day window or six months from these original filings to get their initial permit or their initial license, and we're hopefully having these facilities either permitted and licensed come 2023. Um, there are some overlap in both the co-located and standalone processing rules. Uh, the definitions, some of the financial assurance obligations, the certified operator program, and some of the general rules in the multi-program chapter can also be found in, in both rule sets. So, if you're looking at the packages and you maybe have some questions when you're looking at the standalone versus co-located and you see some duplications, that's because both sets of uh, rules will deal with, with these highlighted here. So what's kind of the next steps? Where, where are we going from here? Well, we're updating our construction and demolition debris processing facility webpage. You'll be seeing updates on that webpage uh, within the next week or two. We are developing guidance documents and fact sheets regarding CNDD processing facilities. There'll be some general overview, one page fact sheets, and some more um, detailed in-depth guidance documents regarding these types of facilities. Also some step-by-step -step processes on how to obtain financial assurance. Um, and then other types of um, mixed CNDD or other types of material, including recovered screen material that's generated during processing. We'll have a fact sheet regarding that. Uh, the CNDD units also currently developing the various forms, so either license tabs for the landfills um, 
or um, other various daily logs of operations and record keeping, daily inbound, outbound waste receipts, those types of items. Um, lastly, we're going to be offering a series of trainings and webinars uh, here in the spring and summer months. So hopefully uh, you subscribe to our various listserv messages um, and emails we'll be sending out regarding training coming up in May and June. We're looking at doing some industry specific training as well as training to our health district partners, as well as our own inspectors and engineers. So with that said, that's kind of the general overview of construction and demolition uh, debris processing uh, currently. Like I said, there'll be more coming up on the web page shortly, as well as lists of messages regarding upcoming training and additional guidance being created. So I guess at this point, I will open up the floor to see if anybody has any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Um, and Jeff for playing that. Um, does anyone have any uh, questions that that can be relayed or that you want to ask now? If not, we'll move on to the next agenda item, um, which is Julie Brown with Summit County Health Department. Julie, are you on the call? I am on the call. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Wonderful. Good morning. Good morning. OK, can you let me know if you can see it? Yes, we can see it. OK, great. Thank you very much. Um, just by way of introduction, my name is Julie Brown, and I am the Solid Waste Program Supervisor here at Summit County Public Health. Um, I've been with Summit County and the City of Akron Health Departments for 19 years. Uh, we did merge into one joint health department back in 2011. I've been the supervisor for the past eight years, and prior to that, I was the solid waste inspector. So I'm just going to give a little overview of our environmental health uh, division here at the health department, and then specifically our solid waste program. Okay. So we have a pretty large environmental health program here at the health department and environmental health division uh, with a multitude of programs. One of our larger programs is we are a local air agency. Um, so we do cover Summit Portage and Medina counties for air permitting and monitoring and complaints. And I do supervise the air inspectors along with the solid waste program here. Uh, we do complaint investigations, food safety, Healthy Homes, we do have a large um, HUD lead grant, so we do manage that here in Summit County. And then the typical mosquito control, rabies prevention, recreation, school, daycare inspections, uh, along with our solid waste inspections and our water quality program. And here is kind of a general organization chart of our group here. We are, when we are fully staffed, we're about 75 staff members plus a, an additional 10 in the summer for our mosquito summer help. Um, we have under our director, we have four managers and then uh, below them, multiple supervisors, program coordinators and staff. Particularly for our solid waste program, um, some of our activities include, we currently have four landfills that are um, municipal or industrial solid waste landfills that are in their 30 year post closure care period. We had five and one of those did um, exit the 30 years last year. We have three um, open CND landfills and right now four registered um, CND processing facilities. We inspect one infectious waste treatment facility that autoclaves their waste on site. And then we have multiple compost facilities and scrap tire generators. Um, we've identified about 300 scrap tire generators in the county and we do inspect them at least once a year, typically during mosquito season to make sure that they're being stored properly and check their receipts where their, um, who their transporters are and where their tires are going. And then we'll follow up on any of those if we get additional complaints. And then a couple things that um, I think are unique to us are uh, we do manage our unused medication program here at the health department. And I'll talk about that more in a couple minutes. 
We also have a residential sharps collection program um, that we manage from out of our solid waste program. We also are the group that's tasked with responding to all record requests for any environmental site assessments that are being done in the county. So we typically get around three, 300 or so of those requests a year. And so we do respond to those. And then we also participate in the Summit Brownfield Coalition, which I'll touch on in a couple of minutes as well. So just some general um, program information for our solid waste program. We are an approved health department through Ohio EPA. Um, our program consists of about 1.75 FTEs. We have one full-time fully dedicated person and two additional staff people who part of their time is spent on the solid waste program. The majority of our funding comes from our Summit Akron Solid Waste Management Authority and then we also get some additional funding through license fees and our residential sharps collection fees. So as I mentioned, we manage our um, unused medication collection program. We affectionately call it our dump program, dispose of unused medications properly. And this program started with an initial startup grant from the Solid Waste Authority back in 2011, which provided enough money so that we could start with um, 11 boxes through at 11 different police departments throughout the county. We provided the boxes, the signs and stickers, some education and startup supplies, and also gave them the money to have the, uh, the boxes bolted to their floors. Since that time, we've expanded the program to 21 locations throughout the county, and we continued to, su to supply the actual boxes, the metal containers for them, uh, but now CVS actually has a program where law enforcement can apply for and receive a collection container right from them for free. Uh, and then they stay as part of our collection program, but we didn't have to supply the cost of the box. So we, um, our management includes coordinating with the 21 police departments, um, working with the sheriff's department to do the collection and transport the drugs to um, an out of county incinerator. We keep the contract with the incineration company and we pay for the incineration costs and we pay for the sheriff's time. Uh, we pay for advertising and just coordinating of the program. And it's something that is very important to us and we're very proud of. Um, since it started, we've diverted about 81,000 pounds of medications. So that has kept them out of landfills and waterways and out of the cupboards and medicine cabinets where there could have been accidental poisonings or overdose. So um, that that's just something that we're really passionate about, even when it comes to, you know, taking it out of our general funds here and not out of a grant. We're going to continue doing this moving forward. Another thing that we created here is a residential sharps program. We had received multiple calls over the years from people who were trying to figure out the proper way to dispose of their sharps containers. People that only had a couple of needles here and there would do something like put them in a coffee can or a um, laundry soap container and toss them in their trash, which was okay. But <clears throat> a lot of the um, hauling companies did not want to see these red sharps containers in their in their curbside trash. So we tried to think of a solution, and because we as a health department are already a, a large quantity generator of infectious waste through our clinic and dental clinic and WIC clinic, um, we decided that we could kind of tag along to that. And so um, we just added some money and some pickup times to our contract with the hauler. And now we can provide residents with a one gallon sharps container for $5. And then for an additional $5, we'll accept the full containers for disposal. And so, we're able to provide that at a low cost for people who want to keep it out of the actual trash, but without the hassle of them trying to save up enough sharps to justify a, a contract with a hauler. And generally, this program just about pays for itself. So we're very happy we can offer that. Now to hit upon a couple of our actual cleanups, our actual more traditional solid waste programs here. Um, I tried to pick a couple of our interesting or more unique cleanups that we've done over the years. This one um, in particular was an unlicensed CND landfill that came to our attention 
a few years ago. Uh, the photo on the left is the outline of the property and the photo on the right is the outline of where waste was actually found on the property. So it was, it was a sizable area. Just a little bit of history for this. This is one of the properties that was an unlicensed landfill prior to 1998. So it was an actual open business until 98. Um, and then once actual rules were created, the owner didn't wanna become a licensed landfill. So he just closed and capped it with a thin layer of soil and grass seed, which was adequate at that time. And then we never heard about it again until 2016 when we received a complaint about open dumping. It was very far off the road and in the middle of the woods and really there was no way to actually see that there was any issue until we got this complaint. So we opened up a file on this property and spent the next two years trying to work with the owner and the tenant and try and attempt to get it, if not cleaned up, at least stop the dumping from continuing. And it, it, it was a gigantic challenge, but after two years, we actually partnered with the local municipality and prosecuted the owner and the tenant and required them to clean it up. Um, so the cleanup occurred over four months in 2018, and then ultimately two acres of property uh, were cleaned up. So here's a few pictures of before, before the cleanup began. And if you recall, this is all mostly on top of an existing CND landfill. So the requirements for them to clean up only included any of the material that was laid on top of the existing landfill. There was no expectation that there'd be any excavation or removing anything under the surface. So you can see there was furniture, there was a hot tub, there were tires, solid waste, construction debris, junk vehicles, a boat, a couple of half trucks and tractors there. It was a very large uh, undertaking. And here's sort of a halfway through or partway through the cleanup. There was uh, multiple people out there working, trying to sort the material depending on where it was gonna go. And one thing we were able to do was work with the contractor to put a gate across the property um, they provided the gate and we hired a fence company to actually come and just put the fence posts in. Um, as you can see, it wasn't that successful. Somebody really wanted in there. They just drove through the fence and broke the fence post right off. So continuing to limit access was one of the challenges that we ran into during this. But after that, um, we were able to get it completely cleaned and they, they um, seeded, they grass seeded and strawed the property and it, it looks amazing and just completely brand new. Some of the challenges with that program, uh, as I mentioned, the debris wasn't just one type. So it was solid waste, C&D, clean hard fill, junk vehicles. So it took different agencies to come in and do some of the cleanup. It took a lot of sorting to determine where everything was going to go. The owner was actually retired, lived in California. He was, he was nowhere near here. I never met him. Uh, he had very little to do with this other than he did ultimately pay for the entire cleanup. Um, the tenant on the property had told us that there was a land contract and he was actually the owner, but we were unable to ever find a recorded land contract. So we had to basically um, work with the owner who was actually still the owner. Um, he had thought maybe he had wiped his hands clean of this property, but unfortunately he hadn't. The tenant was in and out of prison during this time. The um, sewage treatment system on the property failed. So the house on the property was condemned and ultimately vacated and boarded up. The tenant's ex-wife owned property down the road in, in the next town over. So a lot of the material left this property and magically appeared on that property. So. We had to spend some time cleaning up the additional property and working with that municipality. Uh, we did end up paying for a fence and a gate to go across the front of that property to stop the dumping. And we were on site two or three times a week during the entire four month cleanup and at least once every two weeks for the entire two years of the, of the project out there. But ultimately it was cleaned up and it was paid for by the owner. There was no, there weren't any taxes assessed. And now four years later, the property is completely vacant, um, secured and just overgrown with grass. So the, the problem has, has been fixed. This next cleanup is probably a familiar site to a lot of people who work in this program. 
it was just um, an abandoned tire shop. The tires were left there. And in it, since this time, we've worked with municipalities to try and uh, apply for the no fault tire cleanup through Ohio EPA. But this was a few years back when that wasn't something we commonly did. And the municipality and the health department wanted these cleaned up right away because it was a giant mosquito problem. So the municipality provided maintenance workers to pull the tires out of the woods and bushes and everything for us. And we ultimately used our summer mosquito crew to load the tires. We had a transporter drop off this um, trailer, we filled it up and then they took it away for us. And in this particular case, I wasn't able to get an after picture. So I don't have the, the fully vacant lot, but the tires were removed. Um, it was the quickest solution possible, but I don't know that we would necessarily go this route again um, as our mosquito crew is not typically in the, uh, it's not usually in their job description to kind of do these large of cleanups. They'll pick up small tires throughout the county as they're driving around, um, you know, to, going to their mosquito traps and, and putting larvicide down. But I don't know that we would ask them to, to pick up several thousand tires again. And the final cleanup, the one that was interesting was, uh, this was in another residential property in a different municipality. And it was actually the site of the home of a man who owned a small trash hauling business. And it got to the point where he wasn't hauling the solid waste of the trash, the residential waste anywhere, and he was just taking it back to his property. This was a mix of full roll-off containers and tires and furniture and just junk everywhere. Um, so in this particular case, the owner himself was elderly and ill. He wasn't really able to do any cleanup. His family helped as much as they could, uh, and they did actually secure the property with a fence and a gate to keep any additional dumping from happening, but they couldn't clean it up. And we ultimately worked with the municipality to, um, to go to court and order the cleanup. And in this case, that, that township actually coordinated and paid for the cleanup. They had multiple zoning issues. And so they really took the lead on this and did an excellent job. They got it cleaned up and they ended up having to assess the cost of the cleanup to the taxes on this property. So just in general, as I mentioned, we don't normally perform cleanups. Um, we aren't really equipped for that. We have a small amount of money earmarked every year for nuisance abatement, and that is generally um, small amounts of tires getting picked up or putting fences and gates if necessary, we can assist in securing a property. Um, we do really rely on the local municipalities as much as possible to try and handle that because they're usually more equipped to do that. We also can assist and provide information to municipalities and um, property owners regarding the no-fault scrap tire cleanup. We've had some good luck with that over the past few years and have managed to get a sizable amount of tires cleaned up that way. Um, one thing different from some counties, we don't have a litter or nuisance officer but we are lucky enough to have our own prosecutor. We're hopefully gonna get a litter or nuisance officer in the next few years. Our solid waste authority was going that route when COVID hit and priorities shifted, but we are lucky enough to have our own prosecutor. We don't have to rely and wait on being assigned a county prosecutor. Um, we have the same person, she is dedicated to us. She's part-time, but she does all of our cases and she's familiar with our um, internal codes and it's just really been beneficial having her. And in wrapping up the Brownfield Coalition that I mentioned, um, several years ago, we joined a coalition with NEFCO, our regional planning organization, and the Summit County Development Finance Authority so that we could apply as a coalition for the US EPA Brownfield Assessment Grants. And in the past 10 years, we have been awarded the grant three times. Um, each grant was $600,000, so um, almost $2 million worth of grant money that we've been able to provide funding for uh, multiple phase one and phase two site assessments and asbestos surveys. Um, as part of the coalition, we helped to write the grant application with the primary applicant, which was NEFCO. We gave our input on the, the public health side, the health impacts of the brownfields, and we assisted with reviewing applications for the actual money, who we were gonna award that to, 
as well as contractor um, proposals. And we were able to supply that money to a lot of the municipalities here who then added their own development money and were able to make giant improvements in different areas. We have several areas in the county that are just completely redeveloped with the assistance of this money. So it's been something really interesting and rewarding to be a part of. Um, we've been able to attend multiple state and national brownfield conferences as part of this. And that is really, really interesting to see kind of how the rest of Ohio and the country are the innovative and creative things that they're doing to re rehabilitate their brownfields. So just summarizing kind of the strengths of our solid waste program, we have formed very strong partnerships with all the local municipalities. Um, we get excellent cooperation with zoning, planning, law department, local nuisance abatement crews, and then very strong partnerships with other governmental and quasi-governmental agencies like our Solid Waste Authority, Ohio EPA, the Soil and Water Conservation Di District, NEFCO. Um, one of our biggest strengths I think that we have here in the Solid Waste Program and in environmental health and at Summit County as a whole is our flexibility and adaptability. We've been called on to do response for H1N1. We had the joy of dealing with Ebola here in Akron in 2014. And of course our COVID-19 response, which took all of us um, working together. And that kind of points out, I think what makes us so successful is our teamwork. And that is it. Uh, are there any questions or anything specific that I could answer? I did include my contact information in case anyone wanted to reach out to me afterwards. I do know that several different health departments have already contacted me asking a little bit more about our, our residential sharps collection program. So I'd be happy to give anyone any additional information they, they would like. Thank you so much, Julie. That was a really great presentation. I, I really love hearing um, the good things that everyone is doing um, across the state and uh, Summit County is definitely a leader um, in, in your solid and infectious waste program. So um, I applaud you all for the great work you're doing. Um, if anyone has any questions for Julie, um, please feel free to unmute yourself or drop something in the chat. All right. If not, um, thank you again, Julie. Um, appreciate you taking the time to, to present this morning. Sure, no problem. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, next on the agenda, um, we would like to recognize Paul Montgomery. Paul is the Environmental Health Director with Perry County Health Department, and Paul plans to retire the end of May. Uh, Paul has volunteered as a member of the Health Department Advisory Panel since the panel was started and has been an important figure in guiding us and building a stronger relationship with Ohio EPA. So um, just want to recognize Paul for his uh, contributions and his volunteering for the panel and give him a, a big congratulations on his upcoming retirement. Paul, is there anything that you wanted to uh, say? I'll um, open the floor to you, if you would. <laughs> well, it's been a long haul, but I finally made it. I've got 30 years in, and I think it's time for me to retire and go enjoy life. Absolutely. Well, congratulations, and, and thank you so much for being on the panel and being a part of this, um, we really appreciate it. Well, thank you. All right. Um, the next item on our agenda is uh, finalizing the Health Department Advisory Panel bylaws. We talked about this uh, in detail during the last um, uh, the last meeting and. Um, now need to uh, hopefully finalize um, these bylaws. So <clears throat> Jeff did send out an email uh, this morning just before uh, our meeting started with some highlighted uh, sections that we need to cover. So uh, Jeff, did you want to walk us through this or would you like me to? 
I'm sure yeah, I can go ahead and go through those comments. Um, so um, I think we we had made some comments during the last and we added into the bylaws. Those are all reflected there, but there were some things that the panel uh, needs to determine and kind of uh, we need if you need to vote on those or how you want to determine that. And um, I guess one of the first things the topics for discussion, uh, there's a mention in there if you refer to that as um, when a panel member is unable to fill the fulfill the commitment and let me find a page for there. Um, yeah, and that's on page two of the bylaws, I believe. Um, if panel member cannot fulfill their three year commitment, their position on the health department advisor panel will be relinquished. The Ohio EPA and the health department advisor panel nom nominated committee will recruit a new member to represent the district. So one of the things we have to determine based on that is uh, what are those commitments? What do they need to fulfill? So one thing we were wondering, um, do we want to look at it? How many meetings can a member miss before their position is relinquished? So should missing meetings be measured by the number of meetings missed over a certain period of time or a number of consecutive meetings? And I'm assuming probably if there was any um, communication with the uh, chair or Ohio EPA, that would be considered an excused absence. So just for discussion, how do the members feel that missing meetings, how should that be accounted for? And maybe just to start this discussion there too. Um, so we were thinking um, typically we schedule four meetings a year. Do we want to have that measurement based on an annual base? Or, uh, annual figure. So if you miss out of two or three of the four meetings. Is that the way you want to go or if you continue that out? Um, if you miss four consecutive meetings and chat, you may want to weigh on that too. Yeah, uh, is Craig Craig Ward on the, the line? Yes, I was just about to chime in and I was just going to okay. have a suggestion for it. I like the whole idea of, you know, three consecutive quarterly meetings missed or three in a given year. And again, that don't have an excuse. I like that idea. That way we can replace by hopefully the last meeting or going into the next year. So that way we don't lose somebody for a whole year. That would be my suggestion. All right. Amazing. This is Larry. Amazingly, that's exactly what I was going to say. Great. So, um, Craig, it, you said um, three consecutive quarterly meetings, or what was the or, other? Or three in a given year. Again, you miss the first two, then you attend the third, but then you miss the last one. And again, we probably talked to him, but again, it, the whole idea is that you're not notifying the panel. You don't have a valid excuse for kind of leaving it. Okay. And I assume that in a given year, we would say a calendar year, correct? Correct. Okay. And you all can see my screen okay? See the yes. document, the changes that I made? Okay. Okay. And does that sound agreeable to everyone? I think it's a pretty good plan. This yeah, I'd make a motion. Uh, I make a motion we adopt that. I'll second that motion. This is Chuck. All right, we've got a motion to accept in a second. Uh, those changes to the uh, uh, commitment section of the, the bylaws. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed say no. All right, motion carries. All right, excellent. So yeah, we will make that um, three consecutive meetings or um, three meetings within a calendar year. And uh, we've also identified, um, we've, I guess we've only identified two criteria for not fulfilling a commitment. The other one we have there is that the member leaves their health department. So, uh, we could be specific. They leave their health department and stay within the same um, Ohio EPA district. They wouldn't have to relinquish their seat. But if they go from 
another health department in another district, or they leave the health department and find another job in another field, um, that would be a reason to relinquish that seat. So um, what are your thoughts on that? This is kind of a set. This is Craig Ward again. I, I have a separate thought on this too. One thing I don't know if we ever considered was if um, that health department would no longer be an approved district. Would we want to have them relinquish their seat at that point because they would no longer be doing solid waste inspections? I'd say we probably would not want someone not in an approved Correct. health department to be on air. So yeah. Does that capture it? Both of those bullets? I think that looks good. What if the, uh, this is Joe, what, what if the member stays in the health department, but they're you know, they move to a different position that does not administer the. These programs. Yeah, that's a good point. Does that capture it? Yes, thank you. Do we have any additional discussion on um, those points? It sounds like we have no additional discussion on what would be an eligible or ineligible to be on the health department advisory panel. So do we need to make a motion and uh, second that? Yeah, I'm, I'm I, I think that would be um, appropriate since we did that for the other um, change uh, to the first bullet. So can can I get a motion to accept the the three additional um, bullet points in this section. Yes, Mike, I'll make that motion. Thanks, Mike. Do I have a second? Yep, second. Larry, was that you or was that Craig? Oh, Larry. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Say no. OK, great. Motion carries. Um, I think the next uh, topic that we needed to discuss is the process for recommending new members. And I just want to uh, verify that Craig Ward um, has uh, offered to uh, lead or chair the nominating committee. Um, so Craig, would you uh, would you like to speak to that? Sure. Um, just I know we had talked especially at the last meeting about just the kind of process we'd kind of look at. And again, the whole idea would be we try to get representation from throughout the state from all the different districts. 
um, and it would just be something I would work closely with the EPA on and if anybody else from the panel would like to be on that just to figure out a way to you know hopefully keep that position like when we do have someone who retires or moves on switches health departments but maybe still try to keep that position somewhere in their district but be represented by someone who obviously has a solid waste background um, and again kind of goes with what we just talked about with the what we're looking for to be a position on the panel. Great, thank you. Um, I I really like the idea of a a formal nominating committee and and um, for folks to um, send a letter um, expressing their interest and and that that we actually review that for um, appropriateness and um, qualifications to be on the panel. So. Uh, are there any comments from the panel at this point um, about the, the nominating committee? Any discussion on that? In, so Nikki, then, this, is, this is Chet. I mean, I just yeah. I want to obviously we're supportive of this idea. I mean, we recognize that, you know, Paul is, is going to be leaving us here shortly, and there are others that are uh, probably contemplating retirement uh, as well. So it's, it's clear that we need that process in place so that the panel itself, not Ohio EPA, but the panel itself begins governing itself and ensuring that their processes are in place to uh, begin to replace people, but also replace them in the manner which Craig has mentioned to ensure that they work within that area of solid waste. They also represent, you know, that that district relative to Ohio EPA uh, district. So it this is extremely important and it is important to have participants on that committee with Craig. There are people I think that are interested in filling vacancies as they as they occur, uh, but you do need the process and you need uh, that committee to make a recommendation to the full panel uh, for replacement of membership. So are there um, any suggestions then on the wording of this this highlighted section? Um, we we do want the chair, vice chair and, and secretary. Right to be chosen by a majority vote. Um, we need to add. Um, we need to add language in here um, for the rest of the panel members. Um, so feel free um, to to chime in here. Yeah, this is Craig again, just to maybe throw it out there and get him just kind of going off the cuff here, just to put maybe like that we would have a nomination committee that would suggest panel members upon the ending of terms or upon vacancies. Does that sound right? They wouldn't be appointed by the nominating committee, right? They'd be um, recommended. Correct. That's why I was going to say it's just that we would make a recommendation to, I guess, the rest of the panel and then we would vote on them. I believe that might be the case.
How does that look? So panel members will be recommended by the nominating committee. Well, I don't like that to the panel. So panel members will be recommended to the, okay. Yeah. All right, so members will be recommended to the panel by the nominated committee upon the event of a vacancy or expiration of term and be appointed by a majority vote of the panel. Does that make sense? That sounds fine to me. All right, great. Um, I don't know if you just wanted to add maybe new members, if that makes any difference, just to oh, clarify yes. new versus current. Yep. Yes, thank you. Anything else to be clarified or added with that? So, um, Going back up here to the first um, the first sentence of um, the selection and election. Uh, we are we're OK with this. Language here. Chair, vice chair, secretary being chosen. By a majority vote of the panel at the first meeting of the state fiscal year. Yes, I'm fine with that language. OK, awesome. Um, then the next. Item would be um, what uh, what do we need to um, lay out in terms of um, how many years? Uh, how long is the term and? Um, how is that that succession um, played out? I think from from my perspective, um, I like the idea of the vice chair um, taking over for the chair after their um, year or two years of service, whatever that term ends up being. So that you've got the vice chair moves into the chair and then becomes the immediate past chair so that there is some continuity um, but I would I would love to hear from other members of the panel uh, to see what your thoughts are on that. And then throw out there what what you think would be good in terms of um, the the length of of term. This is Craig Ward. I, I like the idea too of obviously going from like at least the vice chair to chair. And if you want to go like secretary to vice chair to chair, um, but if you're going to do that, I would say it's probably going to have to be like a one year term to get through because that's basically a three year commitment. You're almost kind of suggesting if you do it that way, if you went from secretary to vice to chair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I apologize. I forgot to include secretary in there. So thank you for that, Greg. Um, so. Uh, let me see how um, best write that. Honestly, if anyone has suggestions for how best to write that, please chime in. Even if you're not on the panel and, and you're here and, and have suggestions. So, so Nikki, we're we're on the the terms of the the chair. Is that what we're on? I apologize, I had to step yeah. away. Yeah, yeah, Chet. Um, we're we're suggesting that they that a that a member that is um, that that wants to serve almost in that that officer capacity 
Mm -hmm. Right. Start out as secretary for one year, then moves into vice chair then for one year, then moves into chair and then immediate past chair so that there it's a, almost a it's a four year commitment, right? Right. The progression. Uh -huh. Got that. Um, so in other words, the terms of the chair, the vice chair and the secretary are all one year terms. Yeah. Uh, could it be possible that they'd be two year terms? I, I understand what that would mean to the progression of it, however. I'm just thinking that. Um, I, it, it, it's up to the panel. I mean, if it's one year terms, we'll we'll deal with that. I mean. Um, but I think it's simply stated as their their one year terms and progression will be as follows. Secretary, vice chair, chair. This is Craig Ward. If we do the one year term, I think you can put in the progression, you know, that it's kind of implied that you're going from secretary to vice to the chair. I think if you put in two year term, I mean, that's a six year commitment. I don't know about everybody right. else, but I don't know what I'm doing in six years. Um, <laughs> so I, I would say if you did put the two year term in, then we just don't put the progression section in there and it could just be kind of implied that that's what you do, but we don't necessarily have to put it in writing. Because I think that's a lot for someone to say, OK, I'm going to go two years as a secretary, then I know you got two years vice, two years chair. So that's that's a lot of commitment for a voluntary. Committee. <laughs> I agree. It's the panel's decision what they want to do. It's but I agree if it's a two year, then you leave that progression language out. This is Chuck. I, I would agree with leaving the progression out, um, especially if if the desire is to move folks through so that. Like, for example, the Southwest is not constantly represented by the same two people to, to give other people an opportunity to sit on this panel. Locking it up for six years is that's a long time. Yeah, I think that if we have progression in there, it would it would only be one year term. Yeah, this is Barry. Um, yeah, I agree with the just maybe leaving the, the progression language out and just going with the two year terms. Seems like that'd be a lot cleaner, you know, and, and obviously easier to write too. <laughs> so it would be, let's see, each office shall consist of a two year term. And Then there it that leaves us with um, every two years a turnover of chair, vice chair, uh, and secretary potentially. Correct. Potentially. All righty. But Nikki, since you, Mike, and Chuck, have all signed tenure agreements with us. I think we're OK. Negative, negative oh, no. ghostwriter. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Only Nikki signed that. Sorry. <laughs> um, OK, so. Term of the chair is two years. Um, And then, well, that gets deleted. Right. All right. So, it, how are Nikki? We, can I ask you a question? Yeah. I mean, I'm, we probably put this in there. I mean, is it better to have it at the beginning of the state fiscal year or the beginning of the calendar year, or does it matter? For me, I would probably say calendar year um, because I just. I can't keep track of fiscal years. Right. It, it just, yeah. But um, 
I, I'm I'm good either way. Uh, what what does the panel think? Yes, Mike, I would agree with uh, calendar year. This is Barry. I, I would also agree with calendar year. All right. Calendar year it is. All right, any other uh, comments on that uh, or discussion on the. Um, the the terms or selection election. So, so Nikki, how does the nominating committee? This is my agenda item. I'm pile, okay. apologize. The nominating committee. How do they get appointed? Is it appointed by the panel as a whole, or is it appointed by the officers, or how does that work? Not, not that I'm sure we're going to have a rush of people uh, wanting to do it, other than Craig. Um, I guess the question is how they get appointed. Craig, Craig you, you may me? have some ideas. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, just thinking about that. I mean, I think it would just be easier if the chair, vice, and secretary could appoint the members. And then my suggestion would be it would be nice to have a nominating committee member from each represented district, but that's up to four members. I don't know if we necessarily need that many, but it would be nice just to have representation from those other districts because I'm not familiar obviously with like, you know, especially Southeast Southwest Ohio. And you said uh, representation from each. Um, each of the uh, districts from Ohio EPA, so, you know, Northwest, Northeast, Southwest, Southeast. So that would be five members since we have five districts or yes i forget yeah, about central. central central yep okay that sounds good yeah. so nominating committee members shall consist of five members Does that look so nominating committee members shall consist of five members and will be appointed by the chair, vice chair, and secretary with representation from each Ohio EPA district. Yeah, I think that captures it, Nikki. Okay, great. All right, can we um, can I get a motion to accept the changes to section 3.2 and 3.3? This is Chuck, I'll make that motion. Thanks, Chuck. Can I get a second? This is Jeff Ritchie, I second. Thank you. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed say no. All right, hearing none, that motion passes and those changes are accepted. Jeff, was there anything else that we needed to cover with the bylaws? I think those are the main points that we've looked at that we needed to discuss. I think everything else is pretty cut and dry. So um, maybe we just um, finalize this version, send it out to everybody, and then we can just vote on it at the next meeting, if that sounds good. Unless there's other points that other member was going to bring up. So Jeff, would we need to vote on it again since they already made motions to vote on this? 
Um, do we need like an adoption of the, or does that matter? I guess I should read Robert's rules of order, but it's not high on my list. Yeah, how about if we still have a, a quorum? Can we um, can we just move to adopt the the bylaws and and finalize it this meeting? Yeah, Nikki, this Mike. I uh, would make a motion that we adopt the bylaws as written. Thank you, Mike. Uh, do I have a second? This is Chuck, I'll second. Thank you, Chuck. Um, Jeff, could you do a roll call, yes or no, on, on the adoption of these? Sure, let me uh, pull that up here. Okay, so roll call for adoption, Mike Cooper? Uh, yes. Jeff Ritchie? Yes. Craig Ward? Yes. Barry Grise. Yes. Paul DePasco. Paul's not here. Rick Harrison. I believe Rick is here either. Chuck DeYonker. Yes. Larry Schaefer. Yes. Paul Montgomery. Same. Paul may have signed off. So Joe Mazzola, I don't think Joe has joined us. Yeah, Garrett Giozzi. So Richard Novickus and Beck Bifford were not here. So is that one, two, three, four, five, six? So and six, I vote yes. Does my vote Nikki. count? Yes. So you would be seven to 13. So we just got it over it. Okay, great. Thank you so much for doing that. Okay, so um, anyone opposed to that motion of passing the adopting the bylaws as written? Motion carries and our bylaws are officially adopted. Thank you, thank you everyone. It's been a long time coming. And then, uh, okay, so I will stop sharing my screen now. And uh, the last thing on our agenda, open discussion and any other business, um, Chet, did you want to go back to um, the newsletter and touch on that at all? Or I've got a note here about um, future meetings and whether or not folks want to meet virtually or in person. Oh, yes. Thank you for mentioning that. Uh, many of our, our boards uh, and advisory councils are meeting virtually. Oh, excuse me, are starting to meet in person. Um, I know virtually allows a greater flexibility as far as scheduling and obviously saving of time traveling to and from a place. Uh, this panel is, is obviously not appointed by the governor's office like some of our other advisory panels are um, and are required to meet in person this person, this board or panel has the opportunity to choose its own direction in that regard. Uh, so we'd uh, like to get a, a sense of, do you want to have a in-person, a hybrid, or just continue to, to meet virtually uh, so that we can make arrangements for meeting space and scheduling? Uh, so I kind of, our question is just directed to, to you, Nikki, and, and the panel uh, as to your desire as to how to proceed forward. I would like to continue meeting virtually, but um, also want to hear from other panel members. 
Yes, Mike, uh, I agree with meeting virtually a majority of the time. It would be uh, perhaps nice if we could get together in person uh, maybe once during the year. I don't know how people feel about that, but uh, I, the virtual meetings, I we get definitely get better attendance. Yeah, this is Barry. Yeah, Mike, I agree with you as far as maybe having uh, like an annual uh, in-person meeting and have a virtual option too for folks that just that wouldn't even be able to make that one. Um, but maybe just a, a one a one time in person for the year and then the other three virtual. I agree specifically because we can have other people who are on the uh, committee that can attend and listen to. Business. So with that thought, is there a specific time of the year that is is easier for health departments in regards to being able to meet in person? If we were to choose one of our meeting dates uh, to to be in person totally. This mic again. Uh... It would make sense for it to be either spring or uh, summer to avoid uh, bad weather. And I know everybody gets uh, uh, everybody gets uh, really busy at the end of the year and the beginning of the year. So uh, sometime mid uh, mid year would probably make more sense. Yeah. I would agree with that. Then we'll do it. We'll do a hybrid situation where uh, we'll continue to do virtually and, and try to pick that one meeting out of the year uh, to encourage people to, to be in person. That point. In regards to the newsletter, um, it's probably something we'd like to draft up for you as a sample uh, for your next meeting to kind of look at. Um, we might uh, kind of like to poll the panel as to topics that you would like to see as part of that newsletter in regards to best practices from health departments and maybe any suggestions you have in regards to uh, a specific health department that's doing something special in the state, whether it's your health department or someone else's. Uh, so I'm going to ask Jeff to kind of pull together a survey that will go out in regards to uh, topics uh, in health departments that may serve as kind of the first uh, folks to be highlighted in a newsletter. And if we have a sample in front of you, I think that'll at least give you an opportunity to, to have some input in that regard as the direction of that newsletter, if, if that's acceptable. I take it that it is. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah, it sounds good, Chip. Okay. Okay. We'll begin working on that. Thank you, Excellent. Nikki. Yeah, you bet. Um, and then a uh, call for volunteers or suggestions for the um uh the next meeting. Um We've had some really great presentations um, over the past few years and um, would like to uh, continue uh, spreading the word and, and sharing those great stories. So if you do have any uh, suggestions, uh, please send them our way. Either um, reach out to me or reach out to Jeff and let us know um, whether that's you know yourself or another health department, um, we'd love to to hear from you. And um, our next meeting is um, scheduled for uh, July twenty eighth at ten a.m. And Chet, are we are we going to shoot for that one to be um, hybrid? I would assume at this point that that probably be correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
just for notification purposes and where we are on the calendar. All right, sounds good. Anything else that um, folks want to bring up or address before we adjourn? If not, um, can I get a motion to adjourn the meeting? This is Chuck. I'll make the motion to adjourn. Thank you, Chuck. Can I get a second? This is Barry. I'll second. Thanks, Barry. All right. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 <laughs> Great. Thank you all so much. Um, have a great day and thanks for joining us. And uh, please reach out if you have any uh, questions or concerns or ideas for the next meeting. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Nikki. Nice job. Thank you. Bye, everyone.